In this presentation, we will take a look at Alma's chapters 43 through 52 and consider some of the doctrines and principles that it teaches us that can guide and direct us in our lives to become closer to the Savior. So with that, here's an introduction to 43 through 52. Among the questions that naturally arise from a reading of Alma chapters 43 through 62 are the following. Given the constraints of space on Mormon's abridgment of the large plate, why would he devote so much time to a discussion of war? Given that the Book of Mormon has been written for our day, that Mormon and the other prophet writers saw our day and prepared the sacred volume in a way that would help us address the problems and challenges of the last days, what lessons do we learn from the 20 chapters on warfare? Though the list below is by no means exhaustive, we might consider the following important lessons. Number one, the Christian's attitude towards war. War is basically selfish. President David O. McKay stated, focus, quote, Its roots feed in the soil of envy, hatred, desire for domin domination. Its roots, therefore, is always bitter. They who cultivate and propagate spiritual death and destruction and are enemies of the human race. War originates in the hearts of men who seek to despoil, to conquer, or to destroy the individuals or groups of individuals. Self-exaltation is a motivating factor, force the means of attainment. War is rebellious action against moral order. War impels you to hate your enemies. The Prince of Peace says, love your enemies. War says, curse them that curse you. The Prince of Peace says, pray for them that curse you. War says, injure and kill them that hate you. The risen Lord says, do good unto them that hate you. We see that war is incompatible with Christ's teachings. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of peace. War is its antithesis and produces hate. It is vain to attempt to reconcile war with true Christianity. There are, however, two conditions which might justify a truly Christian man to enter, mind you, I say enter, not begin, a war. One, an attempt to dominate and deprive another of his free agency. And two, loyalty to his country. Possibly there is the third, that is, defense of a weak nation that is being unjustified, unjustly crushed by a stronger, ruthless one. To deprive an intelligent human being of his free agency is to commit the crime of the ages. So fundamental in man's eternal progress is his inherent right to choose that the Lord would defend it even at the price of war. Without freedom of thought, freedom of choice, freedom of action, within lawful man's, man cannot progress. End of President McKay's quote. It is in that spirit that the Nephite military leaders approached war. And now the designs of the Nephites was to support their lands and their houses and their wives and their children, that they might preserve them from the hands of their enemies, and also that they might preserve their right and their privileges, yea, and also their liberty, that they might worship God according to the desire, their desires. For they knew that if they should fall into the hands of the Lamanites, that whosoever should worship God in spirit and in truth, the true and the living God, the Lamanites would destroy. That's from Alma 43, 9 through 10. See, it's interesting. God will justify war in defense of these things. But we are not to be the aggressors or the first ones to cause the war. But we have a right to defend our homes, our lands, our liberties, our free agency. Though in many cases the Lamanites did fight with great human strength motivated by their desire for domination, the Nephites were inspired by a better cause, for they were not fighting for monarchy nor power, but they were fighting for their homes and their liberties, their wives and their children. 
and they're all yea for their rights of worship in their church and they were doing that which they felt was their duty which they owed to their god for the lord has said unto them and also unto their fathers that inasmuch as ye are not guilty of the first offense neither the second ye shall not suffer yourselves to be slain by the hand of your enemies and again the lord has said that ye shall defend your families even to bloodshed that's alma 43 47 44 through 47 in regard to the fact that the nephites had been instructed never to begin a war mormon wrote quote, now the nephites were taught to defend themselves against their enemies even to the shedding of blood if it were necessary yea and they were also taught never to give an offense yea and never to raise the sword except it were against an enemy except it were to preserve their lives and this was their faith that by so doing god would prosper them in the land alma 48 14 through 15. number two the importance of righteous military leaders the nephite military leaders were not bloodthirsty they hated war and hated the thought of shedding the blood of their brethren they utilized clever strategies regularly, not only to win the war more rapidly, but also to save lives on both sides. Later in the story, Mormon points out that it was the custom of all the Nephites to appoint for their chief captains, save it were in times of wickedness, someone that had the spirit of revelation and also prophecy. And what more beautiful tribute could be paid to Captain Moroni than the following by Mormon? Moroni was a strong and a mighty man. He was a man of a perfect understanding. Yea, a man that did not delight in the bloodshed. A man whose soul did rejoice in the liberty and freedom of his country and his brethren from bondage and slavery. Yea, a man whose heart did dwell with thanksgiving to his God for the many privileges and blessings which he bestowed upon his people a man who did labor exceedingly for the welfare and safety of his people yea and he was a man who was firm in the faith of christ and he had sworn with an oath to defend his people his rights and his country and his religion even to the loss of blood of his blood to sum up yea verily i say unto you if all men had been and were and ever would be like unto moroni behold the very powers of hell would have been shaken forever. Yea, the devil would never have power over the hearts of the children of men. What a great tribute. A third reason for these include chapters including war. Our attitude toward constituted government. In our day, the Lord has instructed us that the Latter-day Saints in the United States are to be subject to the powers that be until Christ reigns as King of Kings. Though some of Mormon's actions might be offensive to more pacifists of this modern age, he acted in harmony with what he felt was his and others' duty to God, even to the point of compelling dissenters to take up arms in support of the government during war. At those times when he sensed that mortal support for government or the cause of liberty was fading, Moroni single-handedly sought to foster enthusiasm and engender support for the government by reminding the people of their promises to God. This was the essence of the title of Liberty episode. That incident was more than a large prep rally, more than an emotional appeal. It was a covenant renewal ceremony in which this mighty prophet leader called upon the people to remember their duty to God duty to church duty to country and duty to one another as christians for the nephites righteousness was at the heart of good government a government was only as good as its people and its leaders they were convinced that they could enjoy the blessings and protections of the almighty only in a state of faithfulness and fidelity to their covenants thus the people cast their garments at the feet of moroni saying we covenant with our God that we shall be destroyed, even as our brethren in the land northward, 
the Jaredites, if we should fall into transgression, yea, he may cast us at the feet of our enemies, enemies even as we have cast our garments at the feet to be trodden under the foot, if we shall fall into transgression. Similarly, in the change of letters between Moroni and the chief judge Pahoran, even though Moroni is unaware of Pahoran's plight, the judgment seat have been taken over by the kingmen. We see the nobility of soul and fearlessness of Mormon in his attitude towards upholding the Nephite government and destroying all influences which would seek to rob men and women of their inalienable rights. In what might be termed an oath of office for the chief judgeship, we see again the depth of commitment manifested by those chosen to serve the people. And it came to pass in that same year that the people of Nephi had peace restored unto them, that Nephiahah, the second chief judge, died, having filled the judgment seat with perfect uprightness before God. Behold, it came to pass that the son of Nephiah, Pahoran, was appointed to fulfill the judgment seat in the stead of his father. Yea, he was appointed chief judge and governor over the people with an oath and sacred ordinance to judge righteously and to keep the peace and the freedom of the people and to grant unto them their sacred privileges to worship the Lord their God yea, to support and maintain the cause of God in all his days, and to bring the wicked to justice according to their crimes. Those would be reasons why they would be justified in going to war. Number four, the power and influence of a righteous home. Because righteousness was central to the maintenance of the government proper training in the home in the family setting was absolutely necessary. This is illustrated beautifully in the lives of Helaman's 2,000 stripling warriors. These were young men of unusual capacity, persons whose performance on the battlefield could be described as no less than miraculous. In the words of Mormon, and they entered into a covenant to fight for the liberty of their Nephites, their fathers, the anti-Nephi Lehi's, had converted not to take up weapons of war, yea, to protect the land unto the laying down of their lives, yea, even they covenanted that they never would give up their liberty, but they would fight in all cases to protect the Nephites and themselves from bondage. Now behold, there were two thousand of these young men who entered into this covenant and took their weapons of war to defend their country. And now behold, as they never had hitherto been a disadvantage to the Nephites, they became now at this period of time also a great support, for they took their weapons of war, and they would that Helaman would be their leader. And they were all young men, and they were exceedingly valiant for courage, and also for strength and activity. But behold, this was not all, that they were men who were true at all times in whatsoever things they were entrusted. Yea, they were men of truth and soberness, for they had been taught to keep the commandments of God and to walk uprightly before him. Helaman later explained the source of their commitment. Now they never had fought, he wrote to Moroni, yet they did not fear death, and they did not think more upon the liberty of their fathers than they did upon their lives. Yea, they had been taught by their mothers. And if they did not doubt, God would deliver them. And they rehearsed unto me the words of their mothers, saying, We do not doubt our mothers knew it. Truly, the righteous home is the basis of morality and decency, the essential elements in the preservation of a society. You can see why Satan goes after the home and the family so relentlessly in our day and age with transgenderism, homosexuality, lesbianism, all of these things to try to seek and destroy the home because that's where the strength is. Number five, a person's external circumstances need not determine his attitude or his faithfulness. One of the vital messages of the Book of Mormon is that one can re 
remain untainted from the sins of the world, no matter what the extent of the grand degradation of the day. In the day of Alma, in the midst of gross wickedness, there was an element of consummate righteousness. Similarly, during a period which might be called the worst of times, in about 30 B.C., God raised up two young men, Nephi and Lehi, sons of Helaman, whose unswavering devotion to truth wrought a mighty change among thousands of people who listened to their words and witnessed their spiritual power. It was during the period of war that Alma was taken from the midst of the people, presumably translated and taken from the earth without tasting death. Having prophesied concerning the eventual demise of the Nephite nation and then blessed of all his sons, Alma blessed the earth for the righteous sake. Further, he blessed the church, yea, all those who would stand fast in the faith from that time henceforth. And when Alma had done this, he departed out of the land of Zarahemla, as if to go into the land of Melech. And it came to pass that he was never heard of more, as to his death or burial we know not of. But this we know, that he was a righteous man. And the same went abroad in the church, that he was taken up by the Spirit, or buried by the hand of the Lord, even as Moses. This is where we learn that Moses was translated is from the Book of Mormon. But behold, the scripture saith the Lord took Moses unto himself. Elder, and we suppose that he has also received Alma in the spirit unto himself. Therefore, for this cause, we know nothing concerning his death and burial. In short, one can live a life of transcendent faithfulness in the midst of harshness and wickedness. Oddly enough, Mormon writes of a time during the days of the Nephite Wars when, because of the steadfast of the members of the church, they did prosper exceedingly, and they become exceedingly rich, yea, and they did multiply, and wax strong in the land. And thus we see how merciful and just are all the dealings of the Lord to the fulfilling of all his words unto the children of men. Behold, there never was a happier time among the people of Nephi since the days of Nephi than in the days of Moroni, yea, even at this time in the twenty and first year of the reign of the judges. That's Alma 50. Indeed, the Nephite record gives a profound lesson about how one responds to his or her circumstances. Note this language at the end of the wars. And thus ended the thirty and first year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi. And thus they had had wars and bloodsheds and famines and the thirst of and let me try at the end of the first thirty years they had bloodshed and famine and affliction for the space of many years, and they had been murderers and contentions and dissensions, all manner of iniquity among the people of Nephi. Nevertheless, for the righteous sake, yea, because of the prayers of the righteous, they were spared. But behold, because of the exceedingly great length of the war between the Nephites and the Lamanites, many had become hardened, and many were softened because of their affliction, insomuch they did humble themselves before God, even in the depth of humility." Brothers and sisters, we decide on how life will affect us. Either we can become hardened because of our tribulations, or we can become humble and closer to God because of our tribulations. It is entirely up to us. Number six, why God allows the righteous to be slain. War is ugly. Its effects are poignant and painful. It reaches its its reach is devastating. It rushes into premature death a great many of the sons and daughters of God. Captain Moroni, supposing foul play on the part of Pahoran, wrote, Do you not suppose that because so many of your brethren have been killed, that it is because of their wickedness? I say unto you, if you have supposed this, you have supposed in vain. For I say unto you, there are many who have fallen by the sword, and behold, it is to your condemnation referring to the unrighteous. For the Lord suffereth the righteous to be slain, that his justice and judgment may come upon the wicked. Therefore ye need not suppose that the righteous are lost, 
because they are slain. For behold, they do enter into the rest of the Lord their God. Number seven, a prophetic pattern of what is to come. Though it is not pleasant to entertain such a thought, it may be that the chapters on the warfare have been preserved to prepare us for things to come in our day. In the preface to the Doctrine and Covenants, the Savior said, I will that all men should know that day speedily cometh, the hour is not yet, but is nigh at hand, when peace shall be taken from the earth, and the devil shall have power over his own dominion. In the prophecy on wars, which was given some 14 months later, we learn that the war between the states would prove to be the beginning of the end, so far as peace is concerned. Indeed, the time will come that war will be, power, be poured out upon all nations. Here he is referring to the Civil War. We have in the Book of Mormon a superlative collection of stories, lessons, precepts, and warnings, which, if pondered and studied, will help us to prepare as Latter-day Saints for perilous times that surely should be. The decades preceding Christ's first coming may serve as a pattern or type of the years preceding his second coming. President Ezra Taft Benson has explained, quote, in the Book of Mormon, we find a pattern for preparing for the second coming. A major portion of the book centers on the few decades just prior to Christ coming to America. By careful study of that time period, we can determine why some were destroyed in the terrible judgments that preceded his coming, and what brought others to stand at the temple in the land of Bountiful and thrust their hands into the wounds of his hands and feet. From the Book of Mormon, we learn how disciples of Christ live in times of war. End of quote. Let's now turn to Alma chapter 43. Chapter 43, verse 3, the phrase, I return to an account of the wars between the Nephites and the Lamanites. At this point in the book of Alma, chapters 43 through 62, Mormon altered the alerted the reader that he would return to account of the wars. Some people wonder why the Book of Mormon contains so much about war. President Ezra Taft Benson stated that, quote, from the Book of Mormon, we learn how disciples of Christ live in times of war, end of quote. Since Mormon saw our day and knew we would live in a time of war and rumors of wars, he included how to live righteously during these times. Many Latter-day Saints have been and will be involved in military conflict. Look for the gospel principles Mormon included in these chap war chapters. Mormon re revealed the tremendous suffering caused by conflict and also explained why war may be necessary in the defense of life and liberty. Both Mormon and modern prophets have described circumstances when war is justified. President Gordon B. Hinckley related the heavenly sorrow that accompanies such events, even when wars are justified. Quote, I think our Father in Heaven must have wept as he looked down upon his children through the centuries as they have squandered their divine birthright in ruthlessly destroying one another. End of quote. At the time of World War II, the First Presidency issued the following statement, clarifying the Church's position on war. Quote, Members must give allegiance to their sovereign and render its loyal service when called thereunto. This includes military service. But the Church itself as such has no responsibility for these policies, as to which it has no means of doing more than urging its members fully to render their loyalty to their country and to free institutions, which the loftiest patriotism calls for. There is an obligation running from every citizen or subject to the state. This obligation is voiced in the article of faith which declares, we believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates, and obeying, honoring, and sustaining the laws. Obedience to these principles, the members of the church have always felt under obligation to come to the defense of their country when a call to arms was made. 
Thus the church is and must be against war. It cannot regard war as a righteous means of settling international disputes. These should and could be settled, the nations agreeing by peaceful negotiation and adjust adjustments. But the church membership are sub citizens or subject of sovereignties over which the church has no control. When therefore constitutional law Obedient to those principles calls the manhood of the church and to the armed services of any country to which they owe allegiance, their highest civic duty requires that they meet that call. If hearkening to that call and obeying those in command over them, they shall take the lives of those who fight against them. They will not make of them murderers. End of quote by the First Presidency. Chapter 43, verses 4 through 8, the phrase, Nephite dissenters appointed chief captains over Lamanite armies. The Zoramites once belonged to the Nephite nation. Due to pride, however, the Zoramites became Lamanites. Before their defection, Nephite leaders rightfully feared that the Zoramites might enter into alliance with the Lamanites, thus placing the Nephite nation at risk. In order to prevent this mass defection, Alma led a, led a mission to reclaim the Zoramites, many of whom had already abandoned the true faith. Even though some of the Zoramites resorted to the faith, the majority were angry and began to mix with the Lamanites and to stir them up in preparation for war. Lamanite war leaders appointed the more bloodthirsty Zoramites and Almakites as chief captains in an effort to gain an advantage over the Nephites. Isn't it interesting that it's the apostates of the church that are more bloodthirsty? The Zoramites invited the Lamanite hordes to move in and occupy their country as the first major move against the Nephites. At their head came the Lamanite commander-in-chief, the Amalekite Zarahemna. The Amalekites were Nephite dissenters of an earlier day, and like most dissenters, were more bitter against the Nephites and of a more wicked and murderous disposition, disposition than the Lamanites were. Zarahemna had seen to it that all the key commands in the army had gone to the Malachites like himself or to equally for ferocious Zoramites. Thus, we today should not be surprised that then most hatred against the gospel of Christ and church will be among the apostates who once were members but not, f but not follow their lead, but now follow their leader, the devil. I'm sorry, that should be now. Alma 43, verses 13 through 14. Outnumbered and compelled to stand against their enemy. The number of Nephite descenders who became Lamanites was almost as large as the number of Nephites who remained true. This large number combined with the Lamanite armies placed the Nephites at a serious numerical disadvantage. Relying on their faith, however, the Nephites trusted that God would strengthen them during their battles against overwhelming odds, just as he had done for Gideon's army. Brothers and sisters, in this spiritual war against Satan, we are overcome by many numbers of our size in the church. And maybe these wars are teaching us how we as a smaller group can stay faithful from being outnumbered by such a large contingent of wicked people. Today the Lord's people, the righteous members of the church, will be outnumbered by those who seek to destroy the work of God. We too must rely on the faith in the Savior and trust in His ability to accomplish His work, even against great odds. Like the ancient Israelites who were back up against the Red Sea and seeing the Nephite armies coming, were counseled by Moses, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will show you today. 
We each day are given the same counsel in DNC 123.17. Quote, therefore, dearly brethren, let us cheerfully do all things that lie in our power. And then may we stand still with the utmost assurance to see the salvation of God and for his arm to be revealed. End of quote. Chapter 43, verses 15 through 54. Captain Moroni used faith and strategy to defend the Nephites. During his service as chief captain, Moroni relied on his strength and the Lord's power to defend the Nephites. Alma 43 is an example of how Captain Moroni blended his good judgment with his obedience to God's counsel. He prepared each soldier with improved military armor, and he sought the prophet's advice before entering battle. Hugh Nibley writes, The Lamanite com campaign was directed by Amalekite and Zoramite officers whose knowledge of Nephite military secrets and methods would have been given them an enormous advantage over any commander but Moroni. Right at the outset, his foresight had robbed them of their first and logical objective, the buffer land of Jershon. He had taken up his main defensive position there, but when the messengers returned from consulting the prophet, he learned that the Lamanites were planning a surprise by directing their push against the more inaccessible but weaker land of Manti, where they would not be expected. Immediately, Moroni moved his main army into Manti and put the people into a state of preparedness. Do you catch what is happening? Moroni is depending upon the prophet on what to do. If we are going to win our battles, brothers and sisters, we must look to the prophets and obey the counsel that they give us. Informed by every Lamanite move, by his spies and scouts, Moroni was able to lay a trap for the enemy, catching them off guard as they were fording the river Sidon. Captain Moroni expecting, expected the blessing of the Lord because he had given his best efforts. He was perhaps the brightest military mind of his day, and yet he showed humility by following the prophet's counsel. This made Captain Moroni a mighty instrument in the hand of God. As we today sustain and support the leaders God has chosen to lead his people, we too overcome the ongoing battle that started in the pre-existence as being played out and is being played out in mortality. Chapter 43, verses 18 through 22, and then verses 37 and 38. The phrase Moroni's people were armed with swords, with sign-meters, and all manner of weapons of war. What protective armor do we have today? Captain Moroni provided his, provided his army with protective armor, which made a significant difference in the battle against their enemies. President Harold Beely explained one way that we could apply these verses to our lives today. He said, quote, we have the four parts of the body that the Apostle Paul said or saw to be the most vulnerable to the power of darkness. The loins, typifying virtue, chastity. The heart, typifying our conduct. Our feet, our goals, our objectives in life. And finally, our head, our thoughts. We should have our loins girt about with truth. What is truth? Truth said, the Lord said, was knowledge of things as they are, things as they were, and things as they are to come. Our loins should be girt about with truth, the prophet said. Our loins being that area that has the organs to reproduce children. We need to know the truth and to use that power and to only use it within the bonds of marriage. That is the truth of girding our loins with truth. And the heart, what kind of a breastplate shall protect our conduct in life? We shall have over our hearts a breastplate of righteousness. Will, having learned truth, we have a measure by which we can judge between right and wrong, and so our conduct will always be gauged by that thing which we know to be true. Our breastplate to cover our conduct shall be the breastplate 
of righteousness. By what shall we protect our feet? Or by what shall we urge our objectives or our goals in life? Your feet should be shod with the preparations of the gospel of peace. And then finally, the helmet of salvation. What is salvation? Salvation is to be saved. Saved from what? Saved from death and saved from sin. Well now, the Apostle Paul had his armored man holding in his hand a shield and in his other hand a sword, which were the weapons of those days. That shield was the shield of faith and the sword was the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I can't think of any more powerful weapons than faith and a knowledge of the scriptures in which we contain the word of God. One so armored and one so prepared with those weapons is prepared to go out against the enemy. End of quote. Chapter 43, verses 23 through 25. The phrase, knowing of the prophecies of Alma, sent certain men unto him, desiring him that he should inquire of the Lord. Obeying the prophet brings blessings. Captain Moroni's desire to seek and follow the prophet's counsel led to many victories. Life battles today will also be won by following the prophet. President Spencer W. Kimball emphasized why we need to follow the prophets. Let us hearken to those we sustain as prophets and seers, as well as other brethren, as if our eternal life depended on it, because it does. Chapter 43, 45 through 47, the phrase, the Nephites were inspired by a better cause. Ye shall defend your families even unto bloodshed. Human life is sacred. Taking innocent life is an abomination in the sight of the Lord. One may justifiably take up another's life, however, when defending oneself, family, freedom, religion, or country. President Gordon B. Hinckley helped to explain the concept of war and bloodshed. Quote, when war raged between the Nephites and the Lamanites, the record states that the Nephites were inspired by a better cause, for they were not fighting for power, but they were fighting for their homes, their liberties, their wives, their children, and their all, yea, for their rights of worship and their church. They were doing that which they felt was their duty, which they owed to God. The Lord counseled them, defend your families, even unto bloodshed. It is clear from these and other writings that there are times and circumstances when nations are justified, in fact, have an obligation to fight for family, for liberty, and against tyranny, threat, and oppression. We are a freedom-loving people committed to the defense of liberty whenever it is in jeopardy. I believe that God will not hold men and women in uniform responsible as agents of their government in carrying forward that which they were legally obligated to do. It may even be that he will hold us responsible if we try to impede or hedge up the way of those who are involved in a contest with forces of evil and transgression. End of quote. Chapter 43, verses 54, and then chapter 44, verses 1 through 2, and then 48, verses 11 and 22 through 23. Moroni, all of these phrases said, did not delight in bloodshed. Captain Moroni did not delight in bloodshed, even though he was justified in taking another person's life while defending his country. He reluctantly fought the Lamanites for many years. When he did fight, he maintained charity for all, including those on the opposite side. The record states that Captain Moroni stopped the battle on more than one occasion in order to spare as many lives as possible. Lives were taken reluctantly and with sorrow that their brethren were sent out of this world unprepared to meet their God. Captain Moroni firmly believed that those who kept their covenants with God and met with death would be redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ and leave this world rejoicing. 
Some readers may wonder how a man concerned with keeping the covenants of the Lord could be so involved in military affairs. This concern may be why Mormon wrote that Moroni did not delight in bloodshed and was taught never to raise the sword except it were against an enemy, except it were to preserve their lives. Let's now turn to Alma chapter 44. Chapter 44, verse 4, the phrase, Never will the Lord suffer that we shall be destroyed, except we should fall into transgression and deny our faith. This world and Christ's church can be destroyed if we use our agency to fall into transgression and deny the faith. President Spencer W. Kimball gave the following warning while he was in the Quorum of the Twelve, quote, Jesus Christ the Lord is under no obligation to save this world. The people have ignored him, disbelieved him, failed to follow him. They stand at his mercy, which will be extended only if they repent. But to what extent have we repented? Another prophet said, we call evil good and good evil. Men have rationalized themselves into thinking that they are not so bad. Are they fully ripe? Has the rot of ages and flabbiness set in? Can they change? They see evil in their enemies, but none in themselves. Even in the true church, numerous of its people fail to attend their meetings, to tithe their income, to have their regular prayers, to keep all the commandments. We can transform, but will we? It seems we would rather, rather tax ourselves into slavery than to pay our tithes. Rather build protections of walls than drop to our knees with our families in solemn prayers, night and morning. He added, what is the illness? Its symptoms are manifest in every corner of the globe. They are found among men in high places in hunt and mansions. Its symptoms are carelessness, casualness, covetousness, slothfulness, selfishness, dishonesty, disobedience, immorality, uncleanliness, unfaithfulness, ungodliness. People are destroyed by their own acts. There is one principle, a modern prophet said, that we should understand, that is, of blessings and cursings. For instance, we read that war, pestilence, plagues, famine, etc. will be visited upon the inhabitants of the earth, but if distress through the judgments of God comes upon this people, it will be because the majority have turned away from the Lord. There is only one way President Kimball gives to avoid God's wrath and destruction. That infallible cure is simply righteousness, obedience, godliness, honor, and integrity. There is no other cure. End of quote. How are we going to win this battle with Satan down here, brothers and sisters? With righteousness, obedience, godliness, honor, and integrity. Chapter 44, verse 16. The phrase, Zarahemla was exceedingly wroth, and he did stir up the remainder of his soldiers to anger. Zarahemla's anger came because of disappointed pride, which of all the passions that occupy the human heart is the most bitter and malignant. Thus we see the literal fulfillment of the saying, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before our fall. Proverbs 16, 18. 49, four, chapter 44, verse 19, the phrase, They never would come to war against them. Thus ended the war, but not the Zoramite heresy, for we read in the history of later wars between the two nations of certain Lamanite captains being of the Zoramites, foiled in their attempts to destroy their former brethren and to overthrow the Church of God. They still adhered to their false faith and in every way on every possible occasion made manifest their undying hatred to those whose only offense was that they would not join them in their crimes, nor consent to the destruction of the liberty of the people. Isn't that interesting, brothers and sisters, that the wicked cannot stand the righteousness of people, but the righteous are tolerant of the wicked and try to help them. That's an 
interesting thought. Chapter 45. 45. Insert account of the people of Nephi. The insert before the summary of Alma 45 is a part of the original record. The phrase comprising chapters 45 through 62 inclusive was added when the Book of Mormon was published in chapter format in 1879 edition. Chapter 45, 9 through 16. I have somewhat to prophesy unto thee. Alma's question of Helaman revealed to him that Helaman was indeed a man of great faith and that it was safe to prophesy to him of things not yet ready for publication. Alma cautioned Helaman, What I prophesy unto thee not be made known even until the prophecy is fulfilled. Alma then instructed his son to write the words which I shall say, evidently for the good reason that they would then not be forgotten also that no future historian, whether conscious of it or not, should make an error in transcribing it. What I shall prophesy shall not be made known. Alma's prophecy, as, as we shall pres presently see, was not an assuring one. It foretold of God's fierce anger against his people's iniquity. The closing scenes of their history were dark. Destruction awaited them. To publish it now, we think Alma meditated might discourage many labors in God's vineyard from diligently pursuing their task, but instead therefore encourage them to wait the coming of that dreadful day with fear and tears and trembling. The spirit of revelation that imbued Alma's whole being was the power within him to make known the future and also to interpret the past. The spirit of revelation is the forerunner of prophecy. In fact, they are counterparts. Prophecy fulfilling by way of promise what the spirit of revelation makes known. Chapter 45 verses 18 through 19. The phrase, Alma departed and was never heard of more, heard of, and net was never heard of more. Elder R. Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained that the phrase taken up by the Spirit or buried by the hand of the Lord suggests that Alma was translated. Moses, Elijah, and Alma the Younger were translated. The Old Testament account that Moses died and was buried by the hand of the Lord is an unknown grave error. Grave. An unknown grave is an error. It is true that he may have been buried by the hand of the Lord if that expression is a figure of speech, which means he was translated. But the Book of Mormon account in recording that Alma was taken up by the Spirit says, The Scripture saith the Lord took Moses unto himself, and we suppose that he has also received Alma in the Spirit unto himself. It should be remembered that the Nephites had the brass plates, and that they were the Scriptures which gave the account of Moses being taken by the way of translation. As to Elijah, the account of his being taken in a chair of fire by a whirlwind in heaven is majestically set out in the Old Testament. Chapter 45, verses 22 through 24. Helaman went forth among the people. Alma's son Helaman appears to have succeeded him as the presiding high priest of God's church. Helaman and several other members of the priesthood went through the cities of the Nephites, where the de devastating effects of a long war with the Lamanites had disrupted its orderly procedure and there regulated the affairs of the church. Owing to the pride of many who, because of their riches, would not give heed to the instructions given them, nor walk uprightly before God, dissension arose, which in after years led to numerous evils. Among the greatest of these evils was the long-continued war or series of wars between the faithful Nephites on one hand and apostates together with the Lamanites on the other. Still, for four years, Helaman and his associates in the work of restoration were unable to maintain order in the church. Many died in full faith of the gospel and in joyous hope of its never-ending rewards. Indeed, during that period, there was much peace and great posterity. 
prosperity enjoyed by those who remained faithful. So, too, in the latter days, pride, due to the prosperity of the people, will cause some of the dissent from the church. Heed not the teachings of God leaders and walk no more uprightly before God. Chapter, I'm a chapter verse, or chapter 46. 46 through 50, the contrast between wicked and righteous leadership. Mormon explained, exposed, plainly exposed the striking difference between Amalekiah and Captain Moroni. Amalekai wanted to destroy the foundation of liberty which God had granted to the Nephites, and Captain Moroni wanted to preserve it. Wicked men like Amalekai who thrust themselves into power may prosper for a season, but the world's standards by they may prosper for a season by the world's standards, but they ultimately bring ruin upon themselves and their followers. By contrast, leaders like Captain Moroni inspired people with noble desires that will ultimately overpower evil designs. The following chart contrasts Moroni and Amalekiah. Captain Moroni was appointed by the voice of the people and the judges as the chief captain of the armies. Amalekiah obtained power by fraud and deceit. Captain Moroni rallied the people to righteousness and taught them to be faithful to God in their covenants. Amalekai incited the people through hatred and propaganda. Captain Moroni rejoiced in the liberty and freedom of his country and the people, while Amalekai sought to destroy the liberty of the people. Captain Moroni loved his brethren and labored exceedingly for the welfare and safety of his people. Amalekiah did not care for the blood of his people and worked to promote his own selfishness. Captain Moroni, a man governed by righteous principles who taught the Nephites to never raise the sword except to defend one's family, life, or freedoms, while Amalekiah did care not for the blood of his people, or I'm sorry, Amalekiah, a man governed by passion who taught the people to aggressively conquer and make oaths to destroy. Captain Moroni humbly sought God's help in preserving life. Amalekiah cursed God and swore to kill. Captain Moroni worked to put an end to contention and dissension, while Amalekiah worked to create contention and dissension. What a clear contrast between the two and who we should follow. Alma chapter 46, 46 verses 1 through 10, as many as would not hearken to the words of Helaman were gathered together against their brethren. In spite of the exceedingly great care Helaman and his brethren exercised over the church, and notwithstanding their great victory which they had had over the Lamanites, and their great rejoicings which they had because of their deliverance by the hand of the Lord, all of that which was fresh in their minds, many of the Lamanites turned away from God, who had preserved them and helped them, and quickly forgot his mercy and his goodness to those in need. Of them it may be said, there was a change without, therefore there was a change within. They no longer sought to serve him. The desire for riches and for the things of the world crowded all thoughts of God from their hearts. Internal strife and anger possessions marked their relations with each other. Dissension and discord took the place of joy and thanksgiving. The intrigues of apostates and royalists who desired the return of a monar monar monarchical form of government convulsed the whole Nephite community. The rebels who were led by descendants of Zoram, the servants of Laban named Amalekiah, one of the most ambitious, cunning, and unscrupulous characters that ever disgraced the history of ancient America. It was a perilous day for the Nephite nation when this subtle creature bent all his brilliant energies to the fulfillment of his ambitious dreams. True, he had been a member of Christ's holy church, but now the love of God had given place to the hatred of his servants. 
He was a citizen of a republic, but he aspired to overthrow its liberties and reign as king over his fellow men. Indeed, he had cherished thoughts of still greater power, even to be monarch of the entire continent. Both Nephite and Lamanite should bow to his undisturbed sway. Such were his dreams and the continual thoughts of his waking hours. And to this end, he bent all the energy of his mind, all the crass of his soul, all the cunning of his tongue, and all the weight of his influence. His promises, rich as gold and numerous as snowflakes in a winter storm, he beguiled his weaker fellows, men who, like him, loved power, hatred, and truth, delighted in iniquity, but who had not the lofty ambitions and unhallowed valor and the deep designing cunning that distinguished their leader. To his call, the dissatisfied, the corrupt, and the apostate rallied. That the corruption sown by one wicked man may yield a harvest of misery and woe to a nation to any number of individuals is amply shown in the experience of Amalekiah. He even sought to destroy God's church, and not only that, but to bring to naught the government of the people which God had granted them, which was in effect the foundation of liberty to all men who desired to serve him. We also see how quickly a man is to turn from his righteousness and become the servants of evil when earthly goods are presented or are promised to him. In the days of Amalekiah, the righteous man among the Nephites was upbraided because of his righteousness and the wicked one held in repute. Instead of the joy and happiness which God had intended for those who dwelt in the new land of promise, there was grief and sorrow. Sorrow because the troll of men refused to heed his word, and grief because that is the price of iniquity. Thus we see similar conditions today. Members persuaded by the things of the world forget their God and turn away from unrighteousness and political leaders seeking for the power to rule with unrighteous dominion. Chapter 46, verses 12 through 15 and 36, the title of Liberty. Rallying others for a righteous cause takes courage. President Ezra Taft Benson often taught concerning the importance of Captain Moroni's actions in raising the title of liberty. He frequently emphasized the need to be an active citizen and promote liberty and freedom. Improve your community by active participation and service. Remember in your civic responsibilities that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Do something meaningful in defense of your God-given freedom and liberty. End of quote. President Benson further taught, In that sacred volume of scripture, the Book of Mormon, we note the great and prolonged struggle for liberty. We also note the complacency of the people and their frequent willingness to give up their liberty for the promise of a would-be provider. Mormon, like the prophets whose words are recorded in the Book of Mormon, spoke of the Americas as a chosen land, the land of liberty. He led the people in Badu who were willing to fight to maintain their liberty. And the record states that he caused the title of liberty to be hoisted upon every tower which was in the land. And thus Moroni planted the standard of liberty among the Nephites. This is our need today, to plant the standard of liberty among the people throughout the Americas. While this incident occurred some 70 years B.C., the struggle went on through 1,000 years covered by this sacred Book of Mormon record. In fact, the struggle for liberty is a continuing one. It is with us in a very real sense today. End of quote. 48.6 verse 18, the phrase, Until we bring it upon us by our own transgression. Once again we see that we are our own worst enemy. God will not suffer his people to be trodden down and destroyed as long as they are faithful to him. If we are not faithful, then we will be trodden down and this church can be destroyed. 46 verses 23 through 27, the phrase, the prophecy of Joseph's coat. 
The torn coat of Moroni, the title of liberty, was a reminder of the preserved remnant of the coat of Joseph of Egypt. Moroni declared that the Nephites were a remnant of the seed of Joseph and would only continue to be preserved as long as they served God. President Joseph Fielding Smith commented on the symbolism and prophecy regarding the preserved part of Joseph's coat being filled in our day. He said, quote, We are told that there was a prophecy in the destruction of the coat of many colors worn by Joseph. Part of it was preserved, and Jacob, before his death, prophesied that a remnant of the coat was preserved. So should a remnant of Joseph's posterity be preserved. That remnant now found among the Lamanites shall eventually partake of the blessings of the gospel. They shall unite with the remnant which is being gathered from among the nations, and they shall be blessed of the Lord forever. End of quote. This stirring appeal had the effect upon the Nephites of rousing them to unprecedented heights of patriotism and courage. They saw in this call a fulfillment of prophecy uttered many years ago by the remote father of their race to be an instrument in the hands of God in the fulfilling of the words of his prophet instilled in, the hearts, val in their hearts valor for the righteous cause, Moroni proclaimed. As we have noted, he, after having thus urged his co-patriots on, went through the Nephite land, gathering together all those who were desirous to maintain their liberty, to stand against those who had dissented, who were called Amalekites. Chapter 46, verses 37 through 41, the phrase, they began to have peace again in the land. Peace, God's most precious gift, again brought untold blessings to the righteous. Among these blessings were the riches of the world. We often measure the blessings of God bestowed on us in a materialistic manner. Our gold and silver is the standard by which we judge prosperity. In the Book of Mormon, peace and prosperity go hand in hand. Prosperity abounds when peace is established. The people prosper as righteousness prevails. Peace never lies in keeping God's commandments. Peace never lies in, or probably peace never lies in not keeping God's commandments. The saints of God want peace, but not every and any peace. They do not want the peace that is purchased on the battlefield. They do not want the peace that is woven into treaties in the descent, distant capitals of the world, nor the peace of mere conventionalism. But they want peace found upon truth upheld and sustained by the righteousness of God's children everywhere. In this peace, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, many of the Nephites and his people died firmly, believing that their souls were redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus they went out of this world rejoicing. Chapter 47 47 verse 36 Dissension and Contention the Book of Mormon repeatedly warns that those who belong to the church and then dissent become hard in their hearts and are apt to entirely forget the Lord, their God. Elder Nile Maxwell, a quorum of the Twelve Apostles, warned that the same problem exists today when dissenters become critical of the church due to their own pride. Quote, there are the dissenters who leave the church either formally or informally but who cannot leave it alone. Usually anxious to please worldly galleries, they are critical or at least condescending towards the brethren. They do not seek to study the ark, but also on occasion. They not only seek to study the ark, but on occasion give it a hard shove. Often having been taught the same truth, true doctrines as the faithful, they have nevertheless moved in the direction of dissent. They have minds hardened by pride. End of quote. Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described the consequences of contention and dissension. Quote, he that hath the spirit of contention is not of me, saith the Lord. Throughout the world, saints of the Lord have learned that the path of dissent leads to real dangers. The Book of Mormon carries this warning. Not long after their dissensions, they became more hardened and impenitent. 
and more wild, wicked, and ferocious, giving way to intol intol indulgence and all manner of lasciviousness, yea, entirely forgetting the Lord their God. How decisive is the force of dissension. Small acts can lead to such great consequences. Regardless of position or situation, no one can safely assume immunity to contrition's terrible toll, to contention's terrible toll. Contention fosters disunity. End of quote. Alma chapter 48. Chapter 48, 7 through 10, Moroni, on the other hand, had been preparing the minds of the people to be faithful unto the Lord their God, meaning during the time that Amalekiah was obtaining pow personal power by fraud and deceit, Moroni had been busy building up the spiritual enterprise of the Nephites. He taught them to rely on God who in the past had kept and preserved them. Not only that, but he also instructed them in the ways of the Lord to keep his commandments and in all things to be faithful in serving him. Sometimes true followers of Christ must stand as Moroni's people stood in defense of their liberties, their lands, their wives, their children, and their peace. Moroni was intent on helping his people maintain that which was called by their enemies the cause of Christians. With the tide of wickedness in the world today, President Gordon B. Hinckley has advocated that, quote, there are times when we must stand up for right and decency, for freedom and civilization, just as Moroni rallied his people in his day to defense of their wives and their children and the cause of liberty, end of quote. Direct opposition to, and notwithstanding Amalekai's dream of sovereign dominion over both Nephite and Lamanite lands and people, Moroni stood adamant. His inflexible purpose in arming the soldiers of Nephites was to support their liberty, their lands, their wives, their children, and their peace, that they might live unto the Lord their God, and that they might maintain that which was called by their enemy, the cause of Christians. End of quote. Chapter 48, verse 17, the phrase, If all men had been and were never like, would be like tomorrow night, behold, the very powers of hell would have been shaken forever. We too need leaders, whether religious or politically, religiously or politically, of the same quality and faithfulness as tomorrow night, if we are to win this battle with Satan, which started in the pre-existence. May we sustain those whom the Lord has chosen and anointed to lead us spiritually and wise in those whom we choose to lead us politically. Chapter 48, verse 19, the phrase, Helaman and his brethren were no less serviceable. What does it mean that Helaman was no less serviceable? President Howard W. Hunter taught that all righteous service is equally accepted to God even though not everyone will serve in prominent callings. Even though Helaman was not as noticeable or conspicuous as Moroni, he was as serviceable, that is, he was as helpful or useful as Moroni. Not all of us are going to be like Moroni, catching the acclaim of our colleagues all day, every day. Most of us will be quiet, relatively unknown folks who come and go and do our work without fanfare. To those of you who may find that lonely or frightening or just unspectacular, I say you are no less serviceable than the most spectacular of your associates. You too are a part of God's army. Consider, for example, the profound service of a mother or father gives in the quiet anonymity of a worthy Latter-day Saint home. Think of the gospel doctrine teachers and primary choristers and scoutmasters and least society visiting teachers who serve and bless millions but whose names will never be publicly applauded or featured in, nation, in nation's media. Tens of thousands of unseen people make possible our opportunities and happiness every day. As the scriptures state, they are no less serviceable than those whose lives are on the front pages of newspapers. The limelight of history and contemporary attention so often focuses on the one rather than on the many. End of quote. Chapter 48, verse 20. 
the phrase, they were highly favored of the Lord. The Lord does favor certain people over others. However, the great blessing is that all can be favored of the Lord if they use their agency wisely and humble themselves before God. It is us who decides if we are favored of the Lord, not the Lord. We can be favored of the Lord if we choose to use our agency to follow him. That way all can be favored of the Lord if they so choose. Chapter 48, verse 23, the phrase, unprepared to meet their God. Moroni and the Nephite army were saddened that so many Lamanites, apostates, or Amites were killed in battle and sent to the spirit world, unprepared to meet God and suffer in spirit prison. This is just as applicable today for us. No one knows their death date. Whether by war, accident, sickness, or disease, we are prepared. Are we prepared to leave this world and meet God? Chapters 49 through 50. 49 through 50. Fortifications of Nephite cities. Moroni's inspiration and foresight in fortifying the cities proved to be a turning point in the war. Thousands of Nephites were preserved because the cities were prepared. We can apply this lesson by fortifying our own lives with righteous thoughts and deeds in order to withstand evil attacks on or fiery darts of the adversary. The Lord has promised that if we humbly seek him, then he will show us our weaknesses and will make us and will make weak things become strong. The following chart lists some examples of how the fortification of the Nephites could apply to us. How the Nephites were fortified. 1. The weaker fortifications were strengthened. How can we fortify? We must strengthen the weak spots in our lives. The Nephites prepared for the enemy in a manner never known. We can fortify by we must prepare as never before to stand against the wiles of the devil. That will take revelation. The Nephites fortified. The Nephites made their weaker cities into strongholds. How we can fortify? If we come unto Christ, we can make weak things become strong to us. How the Nephites were fortified? The Nephites were given power over their enemies. How we can fortify? If we are faithful and trust the Lord, he will give us power over our enemies. How the Nephites were fortified after some Nephite victories, they did not stop in their preparations. How we can fortify, when we have successfully overcome a temptation or trial, we must not let our guard down, but continue to endure and watch and pray always to not be overcome. Once I have conquered one temptation, move on to the next one that is most pressing in my life and seek to concert conquer it and to keep going until one day they will all be conquered. The Nephites built security towers so they could see the enemy afar off. As we rely on prophets who are modern watchmen on the tower and see afar off, we will be better prepared for the future. We must rely upon the prophets who see afar off. They are prophet seers and revelators. Alma chapter 50, chapter 50 verses 19 through 22, thus we see how merciful and just are all the dealings of the Lord. One of the blessings of having scripture is so that we can see the works of God in, in the lives of his people. We see in these verses that God keeps his word. Those who keep the commandments will prosper, while those who do not bring upon themselves war, destruction, and suffering due to their quarrelings and their contentions, yea, their murderings and their plunderings, their idolatry, their whoredoms, and their admonitions, abominations, I mean. Since God does not vary from what he says, we can put our complete trust and faith in him and his plan. Chapter 51, verse 5. Those who are desirous that Pahoran should be dethroned, they were desirous that the law should be altered in a manner to overthrow the free government and establish a king over the land. 
From the light of the Nephite nation's previous history, men rose up in rebellion to establish laws as the case now in point. Men then, if successful in their uprising, would administer the law for the benefit of the rich and the strong and to, in, and to the injury of those in whose bosom burned one lingering spark of righteousness. The history of the Nephites from beginning to end fully justifies the saying of the wise men, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Chapter 51, verse 8. Those who were in favor of kings were those of high birth, and they sought to be kings. Thus we see the fulfillment of the Lord's words in the latter days. We have learned by sad experience that is the nature and disposition of almost all men. As soon as they get a little authority, as they suppose, they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. 51 verse 13, the phrase, they would not take our arms to defend their country. As citizens, we are subject to the governing laws of our country. Elder Russell M. Nelson offered the following counsel when faced with the duty of taking up arms to defend one's country, quote, men really are brothers because God really is our father. Nevertheless, scriptures are studded with stories of contention and combat. They strongly condemn wars of aggression, but sustain obligations of citizens to defend their families and their freedoms. Members of this church will be called into military service of many nations. We believe that governments were instituted of God for the benefit of man, and that he holds men accountable for their actions in relation to them both in making laws and administering them for the good and safety of society. So for those who are called up to military service, the leaders of the nations will be the ones held accountable on whether that was a just war or not. I would not want that responsibility upon my shoulders. During the Second World War, when members of the church were forced to fight on opposite sides, the First Presidency affirmed, that the state is responsible for the civil control of its citizens or subjects for their political warfare and for the carrying forward of political policies, domestic and foreign. But the church itself as such has no responsibility for these policies other than to urge its members fully to render loyalty to their country. End of quote. Chapter 51, verses 14 through 16. Moroni was exceedingly strong, was exceedingly wroth with the king men. Moroni and the commander in chief of the Nephite armies, be, because of the refractory manner in which the king men objected to taking part in the defense of the republic, grew increasingly angry at their defiance of duty. He himself had labored unceasingly to preserve the lives of the people of all the Nephites, and now that a few of them had been denied privileges by the chief judge, far beyond those allowed by the law, they were ready to scuttle all his work and leave the end, therefore, to the mercy of an implacable foe. His soul was filled with anger against them. Moroni was confronted with a serious problem. He considered well and possibly impossible deleterious effect upon the whole of his people, and a part of them defied successful his authoritative command to take arms in the defense of his liberties. He acted according to the law. He sent a petition to the chief judge, which was backed by the voice of the people, for power to compel the dissenters to help defend their country against the natural enemies or to give him the right to put them to death. Moroni's request was granted. This was, however, an extraordinary circumstance, and it appears to have required the all-powerful vox populi, meaning voice of the people, to give validity to the action of the governor, who was also the chief judge. We may wonder at it, but the history of the Nephites shows that there Many disagreements and contentions were the cause of much of the destruction heaped upon them by their enemies. Dissensions weakened them, and rival fractions among them tore apart what should have been unity of purpose, thereby allowing the Lamanites their consent and their constant enemy to come upon 
a divided people. Moroni saw in the actions of the kingmen a situation that must be done away with, even by the using stern measures. Alma 52. Alma 52, War and Bloodshed. Alma 52 is verification of the Savior's statement that all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Led by the wicked and apostate Nephites, Amaron and others, the Lamanite site to violently capture and maintain Nephite cities. Each city was taken at a high price, however. They had not taken any city, save they had lost much blood. Captain Moroni was always reluctant to take up the sword and far more eager to lay it down for peace. He knew that even when the Nephites were victorious, it cost thousands of lives on both sides. War would never occur if all people were living the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the Prince of Peace, and those who follow him are emissaries of peace. One possible view of this scripture block may relate to strong parallels between Lamanite leaders Zarahemna and Amalekiah and Lucifer. Each was an apostate who rebelled and sought to usurp great power over the Nephites by bringing them into bondage. Parallels between these individuals include the following. Lucifer sought to overthrow the kingdom of God. Lamanite leaders, Nephite dissidents sought to overthrow the government. Lucifer rebelled and apostatized. Lamanite leaders, when not successful, rebelled and defected to the Lamanites. Lucifer sought to destroy the agency of man. Lamanite leaders sought to destroy the liberty of the people. Satan used flattery to win the hearts of men. Lamanite leaders used flattery as a key tactic to gather support. Lucifer stirred many's hearts to anger against that which is good. Lamanite leaders stirred up the Lamanites up to anger against the Nephites. Lucifer sought to grasp men in the bondage of the chains of hell. Lamanite leaders sought to bring the Nephites into bondage. Lucifer maketh war with the saints of God and encompassed them about round about after being cast out of heaven. Lamanite leaders sought to destroy the church of God. You can see plainly from this chart that the Lamanite leaders followed Lucifer. Lucifer was their father, and he guided and directed them in their affairs and seeking the destruction of the Nephites. As a leader in Nephite Lamanite conflicts, Moroni can be seen as a type of Christ. Christ is our spirit, our leader in spiritual conflict. Perhaps Mormon wanted us to see the keys of Mormon used to secure a Nephite victory. These keys have spiritual counterparts the Lord has given to assist us in our spiritual warfare. The keys include those listed in the following chart. Mormon's tactics armed his people with shields and weapons. The Lord's counsel put on the whole armor of God. Mormon's tactics followed with faith the prophet counsel regarding the order of battle. The Lord's counsel, give heed unto all his words and commandments, his being the Lord's. Mormon's tactics raised a standard to his people, giving them purpose, focus, and vision. He had them accept the standard by covenant. The Lord's candle, cleave unto the covenants which thou hast made. Mormon's tactics, keep the people in constant remembrance of the covenants they have made. The Lord's counsel, behold, ye shall meet together oft. For what reason? To give counsel and support in helping each other remember and keep covenants we have made. Moroni's tactics identified and strengthened areas of weakness, especially in areas where the enemy had previously been successful. The Lord's counsel, President Harold B. Lee said, the most important of all the commandments of God is the one that you're having the most difficult keeping today. 
Today is the day for you to work on that until you've been able to conquer that weakness. Then you start on the next one. That's most difficult for you to keep. I make weak things become strong unto you. End of quote. So just as Moroni would go from city to city fortifying those weak, less weak, and making them stronger, we too need to take the commandment we are most weak at and fortify it, and then the next commandment that we are weak at and fortify it, and then the next commandment, and so forth. Moroni's tactics took great care to fortify the cities. The Lord's counsel, every dwelling place of Mount Zion shall be a defense. Moroni's tactics taught the people to look to God for power and strength so they could succeed in battle. The Lord's counsel, see that ye look to God and live. Again, like the other chart, you can see who Moroni's father is whom he follows. Moroni follows the father of all fathers, the king of kings, even our father in heaven and his son, Jesus Christ. Here are some additional considerations concerning these chapters. The time of greatest danger and susceptibility to the Lamanites was when the Nephites were divided by sin, internal dissension, and contention. So we must keep eternal dissension out of the church. Despite the wickedness of some of the Nephites, the people of Nephi were preserved because of the prayers of the righteous. When there were no righteous people, the Nephite societies dissolved. We must continue our prayers of righteousness, brothers and sisters so that we may hopefully bring others into the fold and not completely destroy the church. The Nephites were victorious because of their faith, commitment, and testimony of the 2,000 stripling warriors and put, their trust, and put their trust in God continually. And so must we if we are going to be victorious. Despite perilous times, there never was a happier time among the people of Nephi since the days of Nephi than in the days of Moroni. Even in the midst of destruction and worldly conflict and contention, we can be a happy people if we follow the steps of happiness and righteousness by partaking of the fruit of the tree of life, which brings happiness to all people. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped you with some of the doctrines and principles. If it did, please hit the like button.